If you have your Bibles, turn to Esther chapter 8. Um, this morning we're going to be talking a little bit in, in, in the story of Esther and continuing our series here. And uh, last week we kind of talked about some, some di- uh, hard stuff, some difficult stuff on God and His justice, and that being a, a part that glorifies Himself. And um, kind of a, a difficult topic, especially if maybe that's something that you haven't spent a lot of time thinking through. Um, and, and when we think about even our own salvation, what does it mean that everybody, Romans 3 says, as it is written, there are none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we realize that everybody on this entire planet, right, has fallen short of God's glory. We've sinned, we've violated a holy and righteous and just God in, with our sin. And because of that, we deserve justice. You know, when you're, when you're standing in front of the court and you're standing in front of the judge and you, as you're looking to the judge and you're like, and if you're the one that's kind of been put on the stand, you're not begging for justice in that moment. What are you asking for? Mercy, right? You're asking for forgiveness. Show me some grace, judge. Show me some forgiveness. And as we stand in that seat, we stand condemned. Right? We stand guilty. And we realize that punishment is coming to us. But Jesus was sent, fully God, takes on flesh, become a fully man, fully God, fully man, and he suffers a, or he lives a sinless life, lives completely righteously, and suffers our punishment for us on the cross. In return, those of us who, who believe and trust in him um, can have that forgiveness that Jesus paid for, and he paid that price a 100%. God is not looking at you one day and thinking, thinking, okay, have you done enough good deeds to make up for your sin? Because you can't. There is no possible way you can make up anything to cover that gap. You stand guilty. And so there's only really two places to be in, and that is to say, to stand condemned. And, and no matter how hard you try, no matter how, good, how many good deeds you do, it, it, it won't matter. And you think, well, I've done a lot of good stuff, and there's some really good people in the world who do some really good things, and those are, those are great. But they, they don't matter in the sake of eternity. The only thing that matters is what you do with Jesus. Do you believe in him, accept him, have asked him to forgive you of your sins? And, and, we, and I, I want to make sure that's kind of one component we were talking a little bit last Sunday. But when someone becomes a Christ follower, a believer, it's not just being saved from sin, but what does Jesus do? His, his righteousness has been given as a gift. So when God sees your account and my account before him, and what I mean by righteousness, think of like moral perfection, you know, everything good. He gives that as a gift because of what he's done on the cross, those who believe in him. It's like if you were taking a, a test, you know, if you've gone through college, maybe some students in the room, you know, and you've gone through that test and you just bombed it, right? You failed it. No way possible you're passing that test. Jesus has the 100%, and you get his grade, and he got your grade, right? Substitutionary atonement. It's a switch. Just think about that. It's just crazy. It's just unbelievable. So you pass with the flying colors, right? But you realize what you deserved. You know you deserved the bad grade. You got the good grade. And, and not only does are we just kind of protected from, you know, God's punishment, but now we have forgiveness, eternal life, and, and God's very own goodness upon us. And we get to spend eternity forever in heaven. In fact, 1 Corinthians talks about that we're even be this, this holy day of being heirs of the kingdom. And I, and I don't even fully wrap my mind around exactly what that means. Um, I know that people have kind of gone crazy with some of that terminology, but understanding that, that God has put us in a whole new place, right? We've gone from death we were dead in our sins, where we had no hope and no chance of life and no chance of eternity. And now we've got life. We have life abundant. We have the righteousness of Christ that's upon our shoulders. And, and we can spend eternity in heaven with Jesus forever, living as an heir of the kingdom. It's just an unfathomable, amazing thing when you realize how, what we absolutely deserve. And we have to start where what we absolutely deserve, because if we don't understand that, then this stuff is not as good. Does that make sense? When you realize that you absolutely deserve that grade, maybe you're going back to the school analogy, you deserve that bad grade, and that professor gives you slack or whatever, and he gives you like a good grade, and you're like, 
And, and maybe it's like that, that hard professor, you know, he's going he's gonna to grade everybody bad, exactly the grade you got, but for whatever reason, he gives you grace. And you're like, wow, it's just like this awesome feeling. That's what salvation should feel like. And if, and if at any point in time you're thinking, well, I've done, I'm still a good person, I've, I've done a lot of good things, you still don't get it. Your mind, it hasn't resonated that you deserve punishment. And so we have to start with the bad news. You know, we have to start with that understanding of where we're at before a holy and righteous and just God. We need, when we go to, to the God or, or to the Bible, we want to know who God is first. And then we, we realize who we are in light of him. It's always that way, not the other way around. It's not, well, what if, this doesn't make me feel right. We have to make sure we understand all that God is and all that he does. And so today as we talk through Esther chapter 8, um, I want that to kind of be the, the backdrop as we kind of talk about some difficult things again, and um, also just some, some really awesome things. And, and so as we kind of talk about the understanding of our salvation, and we're looking at, when we look at the book of Esther, um, it's, it's how God has saved his, his covenant people, right? God has saved them. He redeems them. He, he takes them from death to life. We see how God protects them. Right? And how God is sovereignly working through all the details. And he is, you know, over these, these, these uh, circumstances that seem inconsequential. You know, and again, I, I'm not going to summarize the, the whole thing of Esther, but God takes this orphan girl, right? And, and even, even in her life, you, you see, not living by the Jewish dietary code, did some pretty questionable things in order to survive, to get by. And yet God uses her to save his kingdom, or save his people, right? For his glory, his purposes, and his sake. It's right. It's like God just orchestrating all these events and God being in control over it all. And, and we can't see the, the big picture. All we see is the little picture. All, all they're seeing here in the story is that little picture. But we have the, the ability to kind of see the whole thing and read the whole story. And it's like, man, why don't you just trust God more? Why don't you just do this? Why don't you just do that? When you look at the, the circumstances, and even, even in your own life, there's, there's been many, many times where I've questioned God, and then, God, what are you doing? How are you leading in this way? How are you guiding in this direction? I don't understand it. I don't get it. That's because I can only see this narrow picture. God's got the whole thing, right? The whole big picture in his hands, and he's orchestrating things to his purpose and his glory. Doesn't mean we'll understand it, but we trust. We trust in the God who is in control. Let's look down in Esther chapter 8 starting in verse 1. We're going to read just through 1 through 8 at first. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave, gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told him, for, her, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman, the Agagite, and the plot which he, that he had devised against the Jews. When the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, Esther rose and stood before the king. And she said, If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and if the thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let an order be written to revoke the letter devised by Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamedatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who were in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows, because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. But you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king, and seal it with the king's ring, for an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. So kind of moving into last week, just a, again a quick recap of last week. Um, there's this, the bad guy of the story, his name is Haman. Haman is a descendant of Amalek, which has historically been a tremendous pain to the Jews. They've harassed them, they've killed them, they've attacked them. They've destroyed families. They've done all these things ever since the Israelites left Egypt. And you remember back in the Exodus story, the Israelites left, left Egypt. And Haman is a descendant of King Agag, who King Saul spared when God told him to, to, to kill him. 
He spared him. He did, disobeyed God. And, and Haman is a direct descendant of Saul's disobedience. Because Saul disobe disobeyed God, Haman is in existence. And now Haman is, going, is trying to destroy the whole Jewish race. That was his goal, to destroy all the Jews. And so Esther, God uses Esther to tell the king through this, all these banquets and a series of events. And the king is furious. He's upset. And Haman is killed. Right? He's hung on a gallows, which is like, don't think Wild West gallows. Think this huge wooden spike way up in the air, and they impale them on it. And so there's just, that's why you don't you know, mess with Persia. It's like kind of one of those things. You mess with us, this is what's going to happen, happen to you. So this happens at the end of Esther 7. But there's still been this edict written by the king that has gone out into every governor all across Persia. Now, it's, it's not the age of the internet. It's not the age of quick communication. So you send, you know, letters by messengers. And if it's got the king's stamp, it's, it's approved. It's official. And the only thing that can change that order is another letter with the king's stamp on it. Right? So before, all they had is this, this king's stamped letter that said, kill all the Jews on this day. Now here we are in Esther 8. Haman is now killed. And this is the point where this decree is still out there. Right? And all the Jews, I guess maybe apart from Esther and Mordecai at this point, are going to be killed. So Esther 8.1, it starts with the king. He gives to Esther the house of Haman. So in, in Persia, whenever somebody were, was killed, um, it's kind of like that. I guess there were some kind of personal property rights, although you know, a lot of that still, it still belonged to the king. The king owned the whole deal. He could do with it what he wanted. But you know, there was some semblance of, hey, this is your property. You have your own piece of land. You have your own house or whatever. The king, the, when Haman dies, the house of Haman goes back to the king, and the king can do with it what he wants. So he gives it to Esther, and Esther gives it to Mordecai, which is her adoptive father and also her cousin because her, her parents were killed or her parents died. We don't know how they, they, were, they died. And it was given over and Mordecai took her in. His only family member left, take her into his family, adopts her, part of the family now. So Esther gives uh, Mordecai the house of Haman. And uh, Esther finally reveals to the king that Mordecai is, is her cousin. And up to this point, and you remember way back in the beginning of Esther, Esther had not revealed anything. That she was, not that she was a Jew, not that she was a, uh, you know, Mordecai was her cousin. And, you know, the last chapter, it kind of comes out, these are my people, they're going to be destroyed, I'm Jewish. Um, her identity comes out, and she starts to reveal more of her identity to the king, lets her know what the, uh, what, lets him know that the relationship there. And then Esther pleads with the king to change the edict. Of course, the king says, okay, um, sounds good. We'll revoke that. And after Esther is begging before the king again for her people, um, she talks about the gallows and then um, uh, basically says, you need to write this in the name of the king, this, this edict. Now think about this. Mordecai goes from sitting in sackcloth and ashes at the king's gate begging for his life only a couple chapters ago. Now, Mordecai has been, I think, I don't know if that happens in the next, next section or not, Mordecai gets the king's signet ring and he becomes the second most powerful person on the planet. He becomes possibly the second most wealthiest person on the planet. I mean, just think about that transformation. The book of Esther is just full of these like plot twists and ironies and everything else. And, and here is Mordecai now from this, this guy that's about to be killed to all of a sudden being like royalty where people are now going to have to tremble before him as they did to Haman in the street. And it's just unbelievable. It's crazy. And I think in this is a beautiful picture of salvation. You know, as, we're, as I was talking about, just we were trying to paint this backdrop of what it means to be saved, that God takes us from, from being dead in our sins and adopts us into his kingdom. 
and, and be taken on as, as a son, right? And when we were once an enemy of the throne, right, what happened with Mordecai and the king? There's only two people in the whole kingdom of Persia that were completely satisfied with this, this decree, right? The whole city of Susa is thrown in confusion when the decree is made out to kill the Jews, but Haman and the king were happy with it, right? They were all happy with it. The king was an enemy of Mordecai because it was his decree. It was his signet ring, his stamp of approval. Now, now the king is not anywhere close to being a good analogy or good representation for God, but it's not a, he's full of sin, full of pride, full of everything else. But this whole picture of Mordecai going from death to, to life. When Jesus takes a hold of your life and he grabs a hold of that and he, he turns you from being dead to now being alive, he makes you alive. When I first became a believer and, and when, I, when I truly understood that the world just looked different, the world seemed different, right? All of a sudden, you know, death is not this kind of scary thing because what happens at the end? Death is not something we fear any longer. We, we get to be in the presence of God forever, right, in, in, in eternity. It's something we, we actually say, this is, a, this is a good thing. Now, again, we don't, look, we don't short circuit that, but we say this is something that we look forward to. A funeral of someone who died with Jesus is something where we can hope in because we know that where they're going. There's a hope that comes from the death of someone who has trusted and placed their faith in Jesus Christ. There's a whole just different worldview. We see people differently. We see things differently. Even for the sake of, you know, what this whole idea of being heirs of the kingdom. To think about that you could have absolutely nothing physical in your possession as a believer, but to die and know that you'll be, have, have, I mean, the, the, the Almighty God will, will have everything before you, all that he has, and you're thinking, this is, this is awaiting us, right? It's, it's just unbelievable. It's unfathomable. There's, when you think about what's, what's greater, in, in uh, the Gospels, Jesus says to his disciples, what is a profit for a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? You can gain everything, you could be the richest man, build the biggest empire in the, in the world, and you would have absolutely nothing. Yet, on the flip side, you could take somebody with absolutely nothing, and they would have everything. This whole paradox of Christianity. We think we're saving. We think we're saving our life. We think we're building up our life. Whoever saves his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It's this whole crazy paradox of Christianity, and, and it's absolutely true. Because what matters is not always just this, this moment. And we think so much in the moment. It's always about what can I do? What is, what's my biggest goal? What's my biggest priority? What's my biggest thing? And if I don't have this, then I don't have everything. I need this to make me happy. I need this to make me fulfilled. I need this to make me sustained. And those things don't sustain. We just sang about Christ being enough. Christ is enough. Jesus is enough. Jesus is our reward. Jesus is everything. And, and being a, a follower of Christ, heirs of the kingdom, we have Jesus for eternity, right? It's this beautiful, amazing thing. We also see in this that God sets up kings and sets up those in power, right? And in just an instant, things can switch and things can turn. You know, when you look at man's kingdoms and, and the, the powers of this world, it, all it takes is an instant and God can destroy them. God has taken, taken armies that were greatly outnumbered, you know, the armies of Israel. And God has just take, make, made them confused. In the story of Gideon, he takes 300 men, and, they're, and they're, all, they're Israelites, and he takes 300 men, and he goes to battle against 100,000 men of, of the Midian army. And so what he does is he, God tells him, you know, you go around this valley and you're going you're gonna to all ca camp around this valley at nighttime. And, and it's where their tent, their the Midian army's tent, the tents that are all in the, this valley. And they have it all set up. And, and every Israelite's got a jar and he's got a, a, a lantern in that jar. And he's got a, a trumpet, I think. And at the, at the time, when the time is right, they break that jar and they're all blowing on the trumpet. They're just yelling and screaming. And what happened was, the Midianites are all asleep, you know, they've been partying all night, or, and they wake up, and all they see around them in this valley is just a circle of lights and just noise circling in. They think some massive army has come to destroy them. 
Well, they're so, they're so I mean, disoriented, they're picking up swords, and they start killing each other. They're thinking each other is the attacking army. Well, they wind up just destroying themselves. And God takes 300 men and winds up winning the victory over 100,000. Man's economy is not the same as God's economy. No matter what you think is the most powerful thing that, that is out there, that exists, that it's insurmountable, that you can't overcome, God is still greater, and God is sovereign over all of that. It doesn't matter what it is. God's sovereign over cancer. God's sovereign over death. God is sovereign over the whole entire universe. And, and it, it doesn't matter to him. You know, it doesn't, you know, like that stuff, it's, like, it's not like a big deal to defeat these things. He spoke the universe into existence, right? The God that spoke the universe into existence is sovereign over all of that. God sets up kings. He takes them down. We don't fear kings. We don't fear powers. We don't fear the, the issues of this earth. We, are, are, we should fear God, right? The God who set all this stuff up in emotion. He's the one we look to. He's the one we worship. He's our Lord. He's everything. God sets up and he takes down. Let's look into verse 9. So what happens in the story? Then the king's scribes were summoned at that time in the third month, which is the month of Savan, on the 23rd day. And an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews, to the satraps and the governors and the officials of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to each province in his own script and to each people in its own language, and also to the Jews in their script and their language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring. Then he sent the letters by mounted couriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service, bred from the royal stud, saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods on one day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. A copy of what was written was to be issued as a decree in every province, being publicly displayed to all peoples, and the Jews were to be ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies. So the couriers mounted on their swift horses that were used in the king's service, rode out hurriedly, urged by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white, with a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple, and the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many people, and many from the peoples of the country, declared themselves Jews, for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. So Mordecai writes this edict to kind of summon all the uh, king's scribes up. The king has given his approval. He's given the signet ring over that he, that he had given to Haman. And remember, the, the king is kind of in, is one of those guys. He's got this humongous kingdom. He depends upon his, gov his uh, advisors. He depends upon his royal court to kind of take care of the day-to-day -day stuff. And, and by giving him the signet ring, he's giving Mordecai the ability to write decrees and orders in, in his name. So he puts all this stuff out there. Um, and, and summons all the king's scribes together, and Mordecai is giving this decree. Um, and of course, the king's approval with his, his ring. And the edict says that, well, first of all, they, they get the best horses, right? This is they're bred from the royal studs. So these are the, the fastest, the best horses in the kingdom. And, and this is supposed to be a swift endeavor. They want to make sure that this decree gets out in time to save all the Jews, that are going to be killed, to make, to make sure every satrap, every governor is going to get this decree to make sure that they're safe and they're protected, to revoke the previous one and also to present this new one. And this is what the, the edict says. It says the edict says that Jews can gather and defend their lives. And so I'm going to look back at that, and that's in, uh, looking down into verse 10. Oh, I'm sorry. No, let's see, verse 11. Now the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and to defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods. 
So here comes this decree, and the basis of the decree is to, to gather and to defend their lives. But here's, a, here's some interesting or possibly some difficult things that we wrestle with, is that it talks about to destroy, to kill, to annihilate any armed forces, including children and women. Now, there's a, there's a couple ways that this verse may be, that actually be talking about. And this is, uh, again, this is one of those passages which you may read it and you may really have some like, what in the world is going on here, right? What's going on? How do we understand this? How do we interpret this? Um, there's, there's two possible interpretations that, that, I, that I see could be going on, and I'll tell you kind of where, where I lean um, after. But the first is that he's talking about annihilating this, the enemies of Israel. Who are the enemies of Israel? Well, the Amalekites were the ones, kind of part of Haman, maybe even a part, and, and God is fulfilling his promise to destroy the Amalekites and completely wipe them out. This may be what's going on here. And I think that's, that absolutely is very possible to what's going on here. Or it could also mean, um, he says, to, it's like the first thing he says, the first little phrase is to gather and to defend, uh, to gather and to defend their lives. So the main goal is that they're, they're gathering, gather their army, they gather their people together to defend their lives, if any attacking people, you know, warring races or whatever, all in the kingdom, and it, it comes up, and they, they have their ability to, to kill, and they have basically a, a written decree from the king that gives them carte blanche, um, you know, immunity to do what they have to to survive. Um, it was when the American Sniper came out, I don't know if any of you guys saw that or not, um, in the movie, there's a, there's a child that's coming forward with a bomb, and he's going forward to, to kill some, some U.S. soldiers, and, you know, Chris Kyle's sitting back in his sniper nest, and he's got the gun out, and he's just struggling. He's like, I take this kid out, what do I do? But he realized that when he has a bomb, if he doesn't take him out, he's going to kill a bunch of other people, including probably himself in the process. So he takes the kid out. Um, that could be what this is talking about here, you know, in the sense of, in the sense of defense. Um, I want to kind of to back up here and talking about difficult passages in, in the Bible. Um, for many of us, we come immediately with our preconceived notion and ideas, emotions, feelings, everything that comes in the, in, when we read, read Scripture. And it's impossible to completely separate those things from a reading of Scripture. But those things are there. That's why when somebody says, oh, I'm completely unbiased. No, you're not. You've all, everybody has biases that you're reading into things. But what we try to do when we read Scripture is to read it, what, and the fancy you know, $4 word is exegetical. We want to read to see what the meaning of the Bible says itself. And then we deal with that appropriately. You know, as a, we see what the Bible says, and then we see how it affects our lives, but not, not the opposite way around. Where a lot of times we read the Bible and we go, hmm, I want to read the Bible, and where am I in the middle of this? What does God have to say to me? And then you kind of ignore the parts that you don't like, and you accept the parts you do like that kind of fit your view. That's not the way we want to do it. We want to kind of go to the other side, and even, even if it's difficult, even if it doesn't quite make sense, because we trust the nature and character of God, because we trust the Bible, and that allows us to then make decisions on how does, that, how does that affect our life every day, right? But take the truth of the Bible that's unchanging and, and help that to then, how does that change me, right? And so when we come to some of these difficult passages, one is that we have to first set aside our emotions um, and try as best you can to, to read that scripture to see what is the original meaning. Secondly, um, you're not going to have it all figured out. As much as we like to try to kind of figure out and have a, just a really clean, really easy to understand answer, the Bible's not always going to make that kind of clear answer just kind of jump out like that. Again, we can have reasoned answers. We have answers that kind of help us understand, but it, it, we have to be comfortable with ambiguity and tension with scripture. Um, here's, here's an example. We used one before. Think about this. Jesus being fully man and fully God. He had to learn how to speak as a baby. But yet, as this being fully God, he knew everything in the universe. God created language. But yet, as a, as a child, he grew and spoke and had to learn how to, how to talk. 
God is omnipresent. Jesus being fully man, fully God, man is limited in presence. I can only, I'm only in one place at one time. I wish I could be more places than once, but I'm only in one place at one time. God is fully, is all-powerful. Man is limited in power. As much as I think I could bench press a car, it's not going to happen, right? God created everything. You know, Jesus grew. He was a carpenter as he sat under the teaching of his, his, his adopted father, Joseph. You know, he learned a trade. He learned how to, he got stronger. He's swinging a hammer all day long, right? He grew in strength. You know, the Bible sees it as he talks about as a kid, Jesus grew in strength, stature, and wisdom. He grew in those ways. Those are, those are two things that seem contradictory, right? That Jesus is fully man, fully God. Those two things don't seem like they can relate. It's called, it's the, again, fancy $4 word, the hypostatic union, how those two things relate. But it, we have to be comfortable with some of those tensions. We have to be comfortable with some of those paradoxes in the Bible because we believe this is who, he, this is who he, God is. Now, it, just imagine, if, if this were something that you could just immediately come to in Christianity, just be like, oh yeah, I've got it all figured out. Now think about that. Would that be a God that created you or a God that you created? Does that make sense? Is that a God that created you or a God that you created? If I have it all figured out, then who's the creator? It's probably me, right? And so many times we operate under, under this ability to say, I want to make God on my own terms. I want to make Christianity on my own terms. And so we are the creator, and we don't go to creator God to see what, what, is, what is right, what is true. And that's what we're doing when we read the Bible. God, who are you, and, and how, do I, how do I follow you? How do I worship you? How do I love you? And so I want to make sure when we come across those difficult passages, that's kind of the, the idea we take. And, th- and at the end, we trust God's character. We may not understand it completely, but we trust God's character in that. In this particular passage, you know, it's, it's talking about God sanctioning holy war. It seems like, at least in the passage here, that's what's going on here. And uh, for, for many of us in the Old Testament, now it's kind of like, well, that's kind of a hard thing, isn't it? Well, God, and I'll think about it, going back to, and this may not solve all the answers, but trying to think of this from an, an overall view of just who we are. God's, God created the entire universe, right? Created human beings. And what happened? First thing in, in the garden, he says, don't eat of the tree or you will die. God warns people, tells them what happens. Man eats of the, of the tree. Well, man isn't killed immediately, dies spiritually, but doesn't, is not killed physically. And, and here's God just, again, being gracious, but he warned man, right? But yet man continues. Then we take the flood, you know, and you think, oh man, that's such a cute little children's story. God wipes out the entire earth except for a family and puts, it on, puts them on a boat and saves them, right? But God, the whole earth does deserve to be destroyed. But what does God do instead? Is he saves some of the people, puts them on this boat and saves their lives, right? God protects them. He saves them. He, he keeps them when they deserve to be destroyed too. Because as as it is written, there are none righteous, no, not one, right? Nobody. God preserves, God protects. God, we deserve, again, as we talked about last week, and I, I don't say this to manipulate you, but to be honest, we deserve to spend eternity in hell for our actions, for our sin, for everything that we've done against the holy and righteous and just God. That's what we deserve. But yet God has, has redeemed us. He's saved us. He's protected us. He's kept us. It's all grace. It's all grace. All right, we don't deserve a bit of it. And so we, we have to understand, see this stuff in, in, in that light. First of all, that God's in control. I may understand it. I don't know what happens. I don't know exactly how this all plays out, but that God has got it and that I trust his character and I trust what I deserve. The Israelites deserve to be wiped out on the gallows, right? For all, I mean, if you think about it, how are they even in this situation in Persia? Because they had been rebellious for years after year after year after year after year after year, turning to other gods, you know, harming, harming you know, the defenseless and the innocent, taking advantage of the poor. And, and as they went throughout, that's what they kept doing again and again and again. And God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take away your land. I'm going to take away everything you've got. And he sends them in to Babylon as captives. And yet even as captives, God says, I'm going to save you. I'm going to give you, your, this, I'm going to give you this stuff back. 
I'm going to put you back in the land. I'm going to build, build land or build uh, jobs and houses and, and have wives and families. And as you do that, I'm going to, to prosper you in the middle of slavery in Persia and all this stuff that comes along here. When they deserve to be wiped out, they were saved. They were saved. God's character, God's gracious, He's merciful, also just. And as we understand what, it, what does this mean, you know, from an Old Testament perspective, we're looking at how God used that in His covenant people. Today, as we understand the New Testament, because of the fulfillment of Christ, we understand today that God is not, God is not wanting the church to engage in holy war. Um, and we want to be careful when we, when we read these kind of things in the Old Testament. These are, these are descriptive passages. It's a narrative. It's a story. Uh, the story happened. It's historical. I believe all, all those things. But it's descriptive. It's telling a story. And so we have to be really careful to not make descriptive passages prescriptive in nature. You know what a prescription is when you go to the doctor, you're sick, the doctor says, here, I'll write you a prescription so you can take care of your sickness, your cold, whatever. This is not a prescription for us to go out and, and commit holy war. We realize that the weapons of our warfare as believers in the New Testament of the church is what? It's the gospel, that we share the gospel. We, we, we love on people. We, we share the love of Christ with people and realize that justice belongs in the hands of God, right? It's not, who am I? I'm not a judge. You can't judge, judge that. That's, God's going to have perfect judgment come judgment time. He's going to handle that. He's going to deal with that. So I want to tell people the good news of what Jesus came to do for them on the cross, that, there's, that Jesus died for them, that he suffered their punishment, that he offers them grace and forgiveness and mercy. For those who believe and trust in him, they can have eternal life. And that those who place their trust in him will be saved from destruction. Right? And that, and that message, wants, we want to go out. That's why we want to plant churches, you know, in Utah. That's why we want to go to India. That's why we want to do ministry locally. That's why we want to share the gospel with our neighbors. Because we, we want them to know the truth of salvation. That Jesus came to die on the cross for their sins and offers them eternal life. Right? That is the, that is the hope of the gospel. And, and we want to share that as much as possible and to be just letting them know, right? The house is on fire. It's going to be burned. Get out. Jesus has provided the way. Jesus has provided the way. That's, that's the, the message we, we take, you know, from in the message of the gospel, the hope of the gospel. It's good news. It's good news for a lost and dying world. Again, as, as you struggle with this, and I, I also want to say, if, if there's anybody here that just, you know, you have extra questions about some of these things, or even just difficult passages in the Bible that you've always struggled with, I would love to, to sit down with you, walk through some stuff with you, talk through difficult things. That's not something we should be afraid of, is the difficulties of Scripture, or even when we come across these things and we struggle. It's okay to struggle. It's okay to have those questions. Um, but talk to somebody. Ask questions. You know, per, Pursue that. Search the Bible yourself. See what the Bible has to say. But I just want you to know I'm here and I love, I love going over the, some stuff like that with you. Um, you know, we'll have you for dinner or we'll get lunch or coffee or something and we'll just, we'll just talk through some of those things. Um, but it's okay to have those, those questions. And then lastly, I kind of want to kind of drill in here on this point that he, he talks about um, kind of at the end, kind of the results of Mordecai's decree and what happens to the Jews is that all these people are now so afraid of the Jews because of what's happened. They're like converting to Judaism. They're like, I'll be Jewish now. I'll be Jewish now. I'll be Jewish now. And they're all becoming converts of Judaism. All because they think there's some benefit for them in becoming Jewish. Almost like if I'm Jewish, there's some good luck attached to this. And I'm going to, I'm going to, it's going to be great for me. It's going to be good for me. It's like a sports team. You ever seen that commercial? Where it's like, it's like this, it's like shows different sports teams. And uh, it's like it's fo during football season. And it's like, if it's stupid, and it's, but it works, keep doing it or something like that. And there's like a guy who like, you know, does a funny dance every time his team gets a touchdown. And like, and, he, and he's thinking like, that's what caused it to happen. You know, so he does the same thing over and over. It's his ritual. It's good luck charm, right? That's kind of what's going on here. People are seeing this as a good luck charm. If I become Jewish, good things will happen to me. People often come to Christianity, they come to Christianity with the same kind of idea. If I come to Jesus, all my problems will be gone. 
I'll get all the riches that I'm hoping for, and I don't have to fear anything else in life ever again. It's like a good luck charm. If you're coming to Christianity for that, you're coming for the wrong reasons. Again, the Bible talks about conversion of the heart, right? That your heart is changed, that you're born again, that there's a new heart there, right? That that's what God does. He makes you new and alive. And, and this whole idea of coming to Jesus because he's, he's king, he's Lord. That's why we turn to Jesus, is because he's king and he's Lord. If you have, and if you turn to Jesus and you're kind of thinking, maybe I'm just here just to see how this works out, almost like a trial or experiment, you haven't come to Jesus. You haven't found Jesus. Jesus is not your king. He's not your Lord. Right? You have not had that conversion in your heart. But if, if he is everything, if Christ is enough, if that's all that is, is there, then you know Jesus is everything. He's enough. He's all that, that, you, that you need. Sometimes we can't treat God like he's some genie in the bottle, right? Or a cosmic vending machine. If I do enough good, God's going to give me good. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. We turn to Jesus just because of who he is. I don't know where you are today. I don't know if some of you today are, are not. You'd say, you know what, Bobby, I don't know if I'm a believer. You know, I kind of come to Jesus kind of for hoping that good things will happen in my life, but I haven't come to him because I know that Jesus is Lord. I stand right in the back around that side of the hallway um, in the foyer, and so if you want to come talk to me as, as we sing, the band sings, I would love to talk with you. I'd love to talk with you with what that looks like. Maybe you're just really struggling. Maybe you have questions. I would love to talk with you and be able to answer some of your questions that you may have. And so as we begin to sing, please come talk to me. Or you can send me an email to bobby at redemptionutah.com, bobby at redemptionutah.com. Whatever God is doing with you in your heart, um, again, I would, I'd love to talk with you. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much.